Hey everybody, my name is Amanda Stanick and I am really honored to be here today. I want to thank the good friends at Fizetagogy for welcoming me to keynote their summit 2.0 and I really am excited about Saturday. I'm working with colleague Bill Walters. We're going to lead a session on physical literacy. There's also some amazing sessions in the first and second block and so I encourage you to join us and check it out. Probably the coolest part about it too is if you are really busy or you want to attend more than one of the sessions in the block is they'll, they put everything up on their website. So if you go to physetagogy.com, you can then watch all of the other wonderful sessions that are going on So at a later date. So I'm really excited about that. I just wanted to share a little bit today uh, related to the topic of saying no to the status quo. It's very clear that you're all here, you're taking time to listen to me. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, um, you know, just this this mindset and this, and this cultural shift, this movement that we're all a part of, uh, coming together virtually in, in addition to sometimes in person to really solve some problems and make the world more active and more healthy and hopefully to and from that more happy, which I think is far too often left out of the conversation, as well as fun. So I'm going to start this with a bit of a uh, maybe not so uplifting story, but you'll see where I'm going with it in a few moments. Karen Thompson Walker's TED Talk, What Fear Can Teach Us, so she, she summarizes a story from 1819, which actually is a story that inspired parts of the book Moby Dick. And in this story, there were some whalers who were lost 1,200 miles from land, 10,000 miles from home. And they were shipwrecked, and they had three options. They were in three lifeboats, and they could either go to the nearest island, um, where there were rumors and some of these islands surrounding cannibalism, or they could go to the further distance of the islands of Hawaii, and potentially um, their perspective was they could they would die in a storm, most certainly. And then the third option, which perhaps was the most real was dying of starvation if they didn't make their trek uh, many, many, many thousands of miles away um, because of their limited food source. But they actually chose option three. And what she talks about in the talk, what fear can teach us, is that we have artistic sides of the brain and we have science parts of the brain. And uh, how we often ignore the science parts of the brain because the artistic side, the imagery, is so vivid. And the reason why I've been you know, thinking about this a lot lately, is I almost feel like we have a society that's so scared about a kid being snatched off the street from riding his or her bike, or falling out of a tree and maybe breaking a bone. We have these things that we see, uh, we hear about, maybe we see them on Dateline TV or what have you, but it's made us put in this, this situation where we have uh, come to a point where we're totally ignoring the science around what we know about physical activity. We're ignoring the science related to physical activity and decreased depression and anxiety and stress among our students. We're ignoring the science about the social benefits of physical activity and coming together in a not, you know, academic setting. We're ignoring the science on what we know about the brain and how shaking the willies and sillies out through physical activity actually puts us in a state more ready to learn. <laughs> and so we are ignoring like the, the whalers we're ignoring um, a really bad consequence because the shorter term potential, more dramatic consequence is there in our minds. And I think that's a big mistake. And I think it's time that we you know, stop ignoring the science and we step out among this and start making decisions, not just in our own teaching, but at the school level to recreate new normal. And it really leads to this question that my colleague, Glenn Young, who I presented with at Shape America last year, it was a former superintendent of his, Mike McKay, in Surrey, British Columbia. When will what we know change what we do? We, you know, had this huge issue lately in the media around measles and vaccinations, and a, a large majority of people stepped forward and really criticized the people who don't vaccinate their children. Um, Rightfully so for, you know, if I may be so controversial in, in something like this because of the science, you know, we, we don't, we're so fortunate in North America to rarely see measles that we would ignore the fact that it's, it's, you know, herd immunization. And so, you know, when will what we know change what we do? So it wasn't until there was kind of an outbreak that people were like, okay, maybe we should do this. But yet we can't just criticize 
make this here for you. We can't just criticize these people um, if we're like ignoring other science around what we know with physical activity. So just like we should adhere to the science that tells us vaccinations don't cause autism, just as we adhere to the science that tells us herd immunization keeps us safe and from dying of horrible preventable death, we should also understand that uh, there's a lot of science around the importance of providing more physical activity. And we're not doing that as in schools and in society, you know, we're, kids didn't ask to be put in this bubble. They didn't ask for adults to invent video games and then give the two of them and use it as a reward. They didn't ask to be kept in a recess if they didn't get their homework done or to work on their literacy or numeracy scores. You know, they didn't ask for us to cut back on affordable school sport options or youth levels, you know, sp school sport options. Uh, they, they didn't ask to be punished with exercise. They didn't ask to be rewarded with food. You know, we, we keep saying, you know, you know you, we don't keep saying, we don't, because we love these kids. People say kids are lazy. They're not lazy. Adults have put them in this bubble. And so it's, I think our job when we come together online is to come up with solutions to not only hook every child in our class, but also to, you know, help society break through this bubble. So in the few decades it took for us to become this really sedentary, um, society to now come together in hopefully a shorter amount of time to reverse this trend. So what I really love about what, you know, the Phys Ed Summit and a lot of this online PD that we, we come together to share, uh, first of all, are the relationships. Um, that's really the thing that I've most enjoyed uh, because of what I feel like, uh, the re and the research supports this, a lot of us, when we're teaching physical education, we're far off in a school, like from the office or the hubs of the school, it's, you know, the gymnasium might be in the playing fields, might be far off, or if we're in the woods with our lessons and we don't get to interact with others. And PE teachers have been documented to feel isolated and marginalized within their school communities. And we can come together now and we can lift each other up. And I love doing this activity actually with my students and, and athletes is, you know, taking candles and lighting each other's candle and what happens to your light shines brighter um, it doesn't it doesn't die or fizzle and so the importance of that of using this online platform to support support one another within the profession is really amazing the other thing that I love about when we come together online is just the way we truly help each other so we're not just you know sharing positive things which is really great and developing relationships which is really great but we're giving suggestions and critical feedback and so some of my favorite interactions have been on Twitter when you know I've been enlightened and my mind has my my thought process has has evolved to, to have a different thought of what's right and why that was and what informed that process so really helping one another um, to, to take risks and solve problems and um, breaking down the barriers for that PD is just really cool about, about the summit. Um, the other thing, another thing, is my whole beef is when people, you know, the beef of mine is when education is perceived as a ladder. Um, it's not a ladder, it's a continuum. And if you don't believe me that it's a continuum, uh, I challenge you to go spend an hour in a kindergarten classroom where a special education teacher is differentiating instruction for all of the five and six year olds in the class. Um, it's, it can't be perceived as a ladder. Um, the best teachers aren't necessarily the ones in admin um, or the ones at the high school level. And that's just such a archaic mindset and so what we do here is we have you know Dr. Pam Moran was my former superintendent in Armand County Virginia and you know she is interacting you know with all the phys ed teachers there are really off the hook amazing and so she's just the con you, you just observe this communication and mutual respect and understanding that goes on between them um, via Twitter is really exciting and that's just one small example I've seen um, professors and practitioners come together to research uh, through through the platform and just really saying, you know, if we don't all inform one another, we're missing out on what's most important um, because our, the daily grind gets pretty busy. And so I love that about this community in that we have people from government, elementary, public, private, at all the different types of schools and sectors that there can be and and that way we get out of these silos and we and we let down our guard and learn from each other which is 
so fantastic. <laughs> the other thing that I love and that I'm so inspired about when we come together in things such as the Phys Ed OG Summit is this growth mindset. And you know, we talk a lot about it for our classes and we really want to implement it with physical education because we often want to say, oh, Phys Ed and Sport, you know, teach life lessons and it's so great. But my mentor, Dr. Steve Danish, famously published news that it doesn't magically teach life lessons and it may teach bad lessons. So we have to be very mindful of that. But what we do when we come online is this real growth mindset. So yes, there might be a brick wall, big deal, right? And so as we're coming together, you know, online to, to figure that out, to ask questions, not just about, you know, our own teaching, though, I challenge us to ask questions about how the system is set up, how um, our infrastructure is set up, how our policy is set up, so that we can, as again, coming back to that new cultural norms around providing kids um, with opportunity. Uh, it, there has to be the provision. It has to be provision. And I really think too, you know, this is some of the, the most fun when I, um, after some of the most fun I've had uh, interacting uh, in a professional development way with colleagues online is, you know, I unfortunately have way too many analogies with cleaning the house and, and cooking and making a mess in the kitchen because I do a lot of that as well. But when you clean your bedroom and when you look at your bedroom and what it looks like before it gets clean is it gets really messy if you do it right. When you're cooking a really nutritious meal, it makes a lot more of a mess than if you're to put in a processed frozen meal in the, in the microwave, right? And that's because, you know, if you don't cut corners and if you allow things to get a little messy, um, the end result is going to be much better. And so when I look at, when I think about this and coming online, and Dr. Luke Kelly at Virginia was one of my um, doctoral dissertation advisors. I used to leave his office every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, and my head felt like it was about to explode. It felt like this bedroom. And that was such a great thing, though, because by the time Friday rolled around, I was that much more ahead in the process of understanding, of connecting all the dots, of asking more questions. And I realized that when I'm to the point of asking more questions is when the real, the real excitement happens. It's when the real learning occurs. And so knowing sometimes in a PE chat or in a Fizetaguchi Summit or one of these online options, my head may feel like it's going to explode. And that's okay because that means I'm growing and I think that is the power of this is when we allow ourselves open to all the other dialogue and we check our egos it's not about being right it's about you know success isn't being right success is, is growth and success is understanding why it's important to grow and aren't those just things we want you know for our students so I hope that you kind of feel all these things on Saturday at the summit and that you know the theme of this year's summit or this summit 2.0 is really around assessment. And I love this image of assessment because when I'm tending to my garden, you know, my tomatoes might need more water, my kale might need more sun, or cooler temperatures actually, but I will treat each vegetable based on how it, what it's showing me. And so when we look at assessment, when you're coming into these workshops this weekend and you're looking at assessment, think about what does this look like for some of my learners and what does it might look like for others and how does it differ? And as we do that, you know, choose the sessions or watch the sessions, if not live eventually, which may be the areas that you need the most growth. You know, research tells us that perceived confidence leads us to participate in what we feel good about ourselves. So choose the things, you know, step out of your comfort zone and choose the topics where you might need the most growth so that you get you know, the most out of your time and you have a chance to, you know, really soak up such rich, rich context. And so looking at yourself, you know, what what needs a little more water in, in your professional portfolio? Uh, you know, for me, I know it, it, it would probably be around, you know, use of Google Docs in order to collect assessment authentically in an environment. And so I would choose that session so that I really could hone that skill, um, you know, so just some, just a little tip, because the reality is our babies need us, our students need us, and every student is someone's child. So when will what we know change what we do? Every student who walks through those doors is someone's baby. We have students who come to us who are homeless, who live on the streets, who are poor, whose families are losing their house, who, who have so fewer opportunities because of the socioeconomic demographic that they live in. And so, and the variety between the haves and the have-nots, 
the variance has never been greater. And the, pop, the percentage of the have-nots has never been greater. And so we have to look when we're coming to these summits and look when we're having these conversations is what information within this helps my students? Is this something that will support my students? All students are important. All students need this in different ways. But where's the information, you know, that's going to have the biggest impact in my class for my students? We want it to be culturally relevant. What's that mean for my students based on my population? So it's not a prescriptive lesson. It's a way of thinking. When we're looking at, you know, this piece of like marginalized youth, if we're ordering a class set of bicycles, do they include adaptive equipment? You know, ask these questions this weekend. Is, so what does this look like in a class that has children with disabilities? Because no playground should be built without being inclusive. What does that say about how we value people in society? You know, is it an adapted swing over in the corner, an accessible swing? Or is it true, like on mulch, so the child needs to be carried to the swing? Or is it on a flat surface where a child can maneuver his or her chair, him or herself, and use an accessible swing where there's a row of three of them centered around eight so that they're the center? So they're not off to the side. So it's not actually promoting segregation but it's truly inclusion. And what does assessment look like? You know, physical literacy includes the fact that um, physical competence can be individualized, the, the term physical literacy that's used in the education sector. And so what does assessment look like? How do we modify assessment and document growth for students who have um, particular challenges? And, and really thinking about this in every conversation going forward. Another really important um, missed opportunity that you know I encourage us all to think about in the summit is the, the notion of active transportation in schools you know is there is it linked to the curriculum is it being taught through the curriculum are there bike racks in the schools um, are children allowed to take their skateboards or their scooters to school if not why not you know and understanding this is good for the earth this is good for health. This is good for learning, you know, health, physical, emotional, social. So really looking at all of these conversations, you know, at the lesson plan level, but at the more societal level, you know, saying, say no to the status quo. Like we have to be fired up and frustrated, uh, yet more inspired and optimistic and, and really act upon this. And as quality PE teachers, I do think it's our job to champion these movements. We can start from a comprehensive school or health promoting school, if you will, approach, uh, and then we can expand. It can create a real nice ripple effect. Come to these sessions, expect our students to ask essential questions in our classes uh, without asking essential questions ourselves of our own teaching, of our own programs, of our own policy, of our own curricula. So how do we ask essential questions coming to it? The speakers are sharing. We're all like coming, volunteering our time to sharing because we want to. It doesn't mean we know everything. It doesn't mean you can't ask a question to help us grow and to further the, the conversation around for everyone participating in that particular block. So everyone's goal should be to ask like at least two really good essential questions in the sessions that you attend to um, push everybody along, you know, kind of that like take one, give one type of type mindset. It's like sharing that, that quality information. And then when you leave the summit and you go to put some of these changes um, into effect into your teaching practice, the key is in the reflection keeping us like a little log or a little journal as what worked really well, what didn't work well. Looking hard in the mirror when your students aren't behaving and saying, was it them or was it, was it really me? And, um, you know, understanding if, they're, if they seem like they're worn out and they're having a really bad day, maybe, maybe they are and maybe they need you to listen and maybe you need to take that time to build that community so they feel supported. So taking the information that you gain from the summit and understanding that replication isn't necessarily the right way to go. Uh, it will be taking that information, taking it down to best suit your learners in your environment, and then reflecting on it and refining it and making it better. 
really everything that we're challenging ourselves with and participation in something like this is exactly the same what we're challenging our students in our classes. Um, because the reality is physical literacy in a healthy active lifestyle will take these children places that they never knew existed. Okay, so we want them out maybe throwing a football as opposed to sitting around and watching football on the weekends. We want them to view fun as not participating in, in risky behavior. That is in getting together with friends and going on a hike um, or, or learning a new sport or a new activity. And so these are the things we're coming, you know, the goals of the summit and the goals of our program. Because the reality is now, those the whalers in 1819, their ship sunk, right? Um, and they were fortunate to get on some lifeboats, but they, they, they didn't all live. They chose a third option, which wasn't the best option. And if they listened to more of the science involved in their decision-making process and to the science part of their brain, they would have not made the same um, choice. To, you know, they, they would have um, not listened to just rumors or they would have went more to safety and not risk that. So we have to make sure with this ship that we write it. Okay, because right now, in the last several decades, we're sinking. Um, physical activity is not the norm in our society. Um, we're still in a thing like, I don't have time to do it, and we think it's okay to say that. Um, people still say, must be nice to have the time, and, and say condescending things if you do um, take time to be active. So, you know, we're not in a position where this, this ship is upright. But I think that if we stick, stay the course, um, it could be a really, you know, we have to get the, the, the speedboat going on it. Like we need to pick up the steam as we're having these conversations around quality physical education. And if we're not, you know, we're not gonna settle for the status quo in our lessons. And we're not gonna settle for keeping kids at a recess or punishing with exercise or any of these other things that are going on that a, a large percentage of po population doesn't even think is, is a norm. Like they don't think it's wrong. So we have to, we have to change that mindset. No pressure. I really, you know, we can do it, but it's it's not the easiest thing, is it? But we can create a ripple effect. Um, if anyone can do it, I, f I really believe that it's, that it's our team. It's our team phys ed. Um, we are gritty, right? We care a lot. We're proud of what we do. Um, and our profession has done a 180 in the last 15 years, thank goodness, um, because we needed to. But I think all all of education has. And so it's a matter of now reaching out to the broader community, pulling people in, seeing what we're doing, allowing, inviting them to watch, celebrate our students' achievements. And, you know, the biggest goal is that it's not that the other content areas are important. It's that we need our students, you know, we need our future engineers to refuse to build a bridge without a bike path. We need um, contractors to grow up, to, to build a new neighborhood and say, nah, -uh, not without sidewalks. You know, we need to stop passing legislation that says kids aren't allowed riding a bike on a sidewalk if the street next to it isn't safe for an eight-year-old to ride his or her bike. And we have to think about these things and put some logic into it. Um, I'm kind of fired up, can you tell? <laughs> i to go for a run after this. Um, but because it's so, uh, it's so damn important. Like, our kids matter. And right now we have a society where so much potential is not being tapped. So much potential is not being tapped. And and that's not right. Like, that's not fair to our kids and their kids. And, you know, we really have to um, stop ignoring the science. And we have to stop, start letting what we know change what we do. And we have to start really spreading that message. So... <laughs> I have no idea how long I've talked. It feels really odd. I'm used to, like, I like talking in front of people. So I'm sorry, this is really awkward for me. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to acknowledge the great people at Pizetagogy who so kindly invited me to um, be a part of this, this session. I want to change the screen here so we can see all of them nicely. Oh, we have a light on Colin, which isn't very great. But um, I want to thank them for all of their work. Um, these, I interact with these people all the time, m along with many others, and their movement is, is really wonderful. You know, they put out blogs as, as they speak to them, um, and, you know, obviously you follow them and you follow their work. And I think that if we keep going with this, if we keep perceiving ourselves as a team, as we keep supporting each other, and we keep um, asking the tough questions and being vulnerable and checking our egos and understanding that this is about everybody's kid, 
it's not about us. <laughs> and, um, you know, and in the meantime, keeping it in moderation so that we're not missing our evening yoga session because we're so busy typing and, and you know, that we're not stuck to this because we're so excited about PD that we don't go for a run, you know, keeping that um, idea and, and modeling that behavior for our students. Uh, and, you know, we have to live it to, to be able to teach and impart it, right? So um, just a, that's like a friendly, a friendly suggestion because our health matters too and our profession needs us and our kids do. So I want to thank you. I wish you a wonderful summit. I don't normally talk that fast. And um, I just, uh, I'm in awe of all of you for giving up your Saturday morning to come together. And uh, hopefully you came back from your run or your walk and you're, you're fired up and you have a great cup of coffee and, and you're ready to go. So thank you for everything that you do and thank you for all that you've shared with me in my online um, PD journey. And I, I'm in awe. Thank you.